Hey, welcome everyone to the ARCHICAD user monthly webinar for January 2022. My name is Eric Bobro, and my special guest today is UK architect Tim Ball. How are you doing, Tim? I'm good. I'm good. Um, I'm sure uh, I haven't been. I haven't done this for a while now, Eric. It's been a couple of years, but uh, you know, it's like it's like riding a bicycle. Hopefully, you remember, yeah. you remember everything. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it will be. By the way, I have my my special assistant here. This is uh, Simone, um, our one year old uh, Brussels Griffon puppy. Um, she'll be assisting some of the behind yeah. the scenes things. Um, so let us know that you can hear us and see us. Uh, so um, just opening up the questions. And when you uh, type into the questions, just say where you're calling in from. Uh, so I see Mario from Rio de Janeiro, okay. And uh, Rom Romerick from Trinidad, Stuart from Australia, Jim, Gerald from Victoria, that's in Canada. And uh, yeah, Gerald, um, probably should have you as a guest as well. Um, Gerald shared some of his uh, fine work a couple of years ago. Um, Harry, all right, nice to see you. And uh, I guess uh, from, I know, somewhere in the east, like Connecticut or somewhere, I can't remember now. Um, Todd from freezing Des Moines, Tracy from east coast of Australia, Jim from Seattle. All right, and Pierre, Pierre from London. By the way, do you know Pierre Moray, uh, Tim? No, no, no. Oh. A lot, UK is a big place, you know, Eric. Oh, is it? Is it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's it been like saying, you know, you know, so so. He lives in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, even though he's an architect, anyway, I should introduce you because, uh, yeah, I think you'd you yeah, find... send, send us our email address. You know, introduce us sort of by email address, and we, you know, we might get together. Yeah. So um, now that we've done, you know, uh, the formalities of just uh, making sure you can all hear us, um, which is great. But do uh, fill in. Um, uh, those of you who are coming in, uh, you know, just say hello. Where are you calling in from? I won't read them all out, but it's always fun to see that. So, Tim, we've worked together for quite a while. I know you had started with Archicad in the 90s, uh, but you were one of the people who joined the best practices course back in 2010 or 2011. And um, we're, you know, I, I, the, the phrase or the saying, uh, comes to mind, school is never out for the pros. So, you know, even though you were very experienced, uh, you, you know, just watched the videos, participated in stuff. And we started having some interesting discussions during the calls where I'm demonstrating, you know, let's say tricky Archicad things, or at least, you know, some intricate stuff that uh, requires explanation. And it became, when we had one conversation, somebody said it felt like graduate school. You know, like sitting in on you know, you know, uh, a discussion among you know, two people, a academics, right? Um, and at that point, we had the idea of um, masters of Archicad, because Tim, I would say, is a master, and uh, you know, sharing knowledge. So you were definitely the a part of the inspiration for the Masters of Archicad Summit, which was a conference that we ran in 2015 and 2016, I think it was. Um, and uh, and then part of your um, work that you showed uh, led to a course, a training course, which is still available. Um, and uh, I would say probably 80% of it is still the way things are done, you know, and, and the other 20% are, are just different commands or tools, but, you know, you're still doing the same thing. You're just using some different um, operations. But uh, I, I just love the fact that you're getting the most out of Archicad, that you're one of these uh, people who says, you know, this tool is powerful. I'm going to really work it to get the most benefit. And you get the benefit in terms of efficiency. You get it in terms of um, the way that you can serve clients. Um, and I'm sure that your clients appreciate it. Um, do you find that some people come to you specifically because you use Archicad? Um, does that does that ever happen? No, no. Uh, sometimes people come to me because I work in 3D. Right. But uh, I I actually believe very strongly that that 
that you should use ARCHICAD because of your practice, not because of your clients. Hmm. Uh, okay. as in my experience, the um, the huge benefit that you can leverage is is to do actually with productivity, which in a sense equals product equals prod profitability. Right. Um, um, can I make you presenter so you can show your website and give people a you know a short tour of your firm and what you do, and then we'll get into the actual project. So let me make you presenter yeah. here. And uh, yeah, see, we are up to 80 some odd people in the room now. Yeah, we'll definitely got a lot of interest for today's presentation. So I've made you presenter. You just need to pick out which screen if you have more than one and say go. Okay. Um. Sorry, where do I pick the screen? Um, in the GoToWebinar control panel, you will see a sharing um, uh, button, and down be right below it, it'll say show which whichever screen you can pick. Mm. No, so are you, are you not seeing the go to webinar control panel. Yeah, I'm looking at that. Sorry, I haven't used this go to webinar. Um, Oh, here we go. It's down here. Show. Here we go. Did I, uh, show. Here we go. Keeps talking about capturing the screen. Um, hmm. Yeah. We didn't do a tech check on this. Um, so you need to give permission to capture the screen. Let me just open the system preferences. Uh, oh, we should have done this before, shouldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> We've done yeah. this so many times in the in past years. I guess uh, while you're figuring that out, um, yeah, we uh, when I launched the Archicad User Monthly Webinar Series, Tim was uh, the, the inaugural guest, and I think we uh, had you come back one year later. But it's been at least two two more years since then, maybe three. I'm not sure. I think I've changed computers as well. Um, here we go. Go to meeting. So, uh, those of you who are watching, um, uh, you know, by the way, Tim, you just turned off your webcam, which is fine. We can do that later. But right for right now, it'd be good to have that turned on. Um, and I'm not. We're not seeing your screen yet. Um, anyway, uh, how many of you have actually seen? Tim and any of his presentations, um, you know, that uh, either ones that I've produced or I know Tim has been pretty prominent in the UK ARCHICAD community um, and uh, been visible there. Let's see what's going on with Tim. Are you there, Tim? So I'm not hearing anything from you, Tim. All right, Gerald says, I've had the pleasure. All right, great. Um, all right, so I'm not sure what's going on with Tim. I'm not hearing him. Uh, I'm assuming that no one else is as well. So I'm gonna make myself presenter right now and uh, show while we're waiting um, for him. It's going to bring up Masters of Archicad website. Um, what's going on, Tim? I can't hear you. This goes to show that a tech run through, even for people who are experienced, it's good to have it make sure it works. So I apologize for the issue here. Um, uh, let me just get something up that I can show you. Um, um, and okay, so this is, I'll be showing my screen for a moment, at least for a little bit. All right, so. While I'm waiting for Tim to reconnect or figure out what's going on, <clears throat> uh, do let me know that you can see my screen and hear it. <laughs> Yasek made a little joke 
Tim has been Brexited, so he's in the UK and UK left the EU with Brexit. Anyway, so here we can see Tim a few years ago, and uh, we have different courses that were created back then. And I guess the one from uh, Tim is called Working Drawings Without Details. And uh, so I know today the intention was in this session to um, uh, make this, um, you know, have Tim show his recent projects and show again how he creates detailed 3D in a way that is um, uh, essentially sufficient without needing any 2D drafting because it really shows how everything fits together. Now, what is going on? I'm going to have to, uh, um, and by the way, you can see information about this at mastersofarchicad.com forward slash training dash series. Um, now let me just see if I can reach him again because I don't know what's going on. This is uh, a little frustrating, but we'll figure it out. Hi. Um, You can't get unmuted? You can't get? Hmm, okay. Let me mute you and, um, interesting. Okay, let me just see if you came in uh, separately again. Oh, I see you come, um, uh, actually, let me just make you panelist. All right, so you must have logged in again um, under a different name. There. Okay. Um, no, still not hearing you, Tim. There we go. Okay, I, there we go. That, that's All fine. Right. Okay. Yeah. So somehow right. you reconnected a second time, so I have you on my list as a panelist twice, which is no problem. But that's why I, I didn't realize that you were in in a separate incarnation, let's say. Um, all yeah. right. So, um, Tim, I'm going to make you, so which one is it? I guess that's the one with the webcam. So let me make you presenter here. And hopefully this time you'll be able to share your screen. Yeah. There we go. Yay. All right. Persistence. Right. Um, all right. So uh, you uh, work in yeah. a particular area of the UK, Kenton, East Sussex. Yeah, so so for those people who don't know the UK very well, uh, Cantony Sussex is right in the bottom right hand corner, uh, and where I live, I'm probably as close to Paris as I am to uh, London, sort of. Uh, certainly close, uh, very close to France. So um, uh, so what we do is modern buildings. So we do houses. We do extensions to houses. This is a rather lovely beach extension. We do very old buildings. In the UK, they're called listed buildings because the, literally there is a list of the historic buildings in the UK. There are several thousand of them. And uh, we do a lot of work with those. Um, we do some pretty wacky houses when we can find a client with the budget. Um, we don't get many of those, unfortunately. Um, we also do things like some swimming pools, uh, and this was one we did a few years ago there. Uh, and we also do some development. Um, that's quite an interesting shot because it hasn't gone ahead yet, but actually that gray building there uh, is actually what we've designed and the rest of it is Google Earth. So that's one where we, I, I don't know whether you've ever tried it, but we use the um, KMZ export uh, facility and dropped it into Google Earth. Um, uh, that's that's probably half an hour's discussion on its own, so we won't go there. Um, and uh, so the portfolio of stuff we do, I mean, you know, new houses, this one's quite an interesting one because that's that's what we designed, it's a bit smaller. That was what was designed in Archicad, um, and uh, that was what was built. So, you know, it just shows you how we can get pretty close um, 
with the, the use of ARCHICAD. Uh, and, um, you know, we do uh, other, other houses like uh, uh, this one um, here, which was out in the countryside, very low. So it, you know, has little impact. Um, you know, some nice interior shots we did. And so it's, that room is fairly sustainable. Some nice solar panels, lots of insulation, um, things of that kind. And uh, we also did, uh, there's one here, where is it? There. Um, this was, um, this is one that we didn't get planning consent for, but this is probably the first job I used um, twin motion on, uh, hmm. which I'll talk about in another job. So we were able to get some nice shots like this. And this is all um, done. Well, I say it's all done in ARCHICAD. Interestingly, some of the foliage was done in SketchUp because my colleague works in SketchUp and we managed to, um, I managed to use some of that, which was quite fun. But things like this, this, this sort of growth on the roof here is actually a hedge plant exploded into a morph and then rotated round so it hangs in the roof like that. So, so basically I'm pretty creative about, you know, how I use ARCHICAD. Uh, I can't remember the last time I found anything I couldn't draw in it. Um, you know, so that's quite that, that's quite good. Um, anyway, that gives you an idea of the kind of practice we are. There's only me and one other guy, and we do. And the reason we can actually make that work is because of the fact that we really absolutely leverage Archicad. Um, right. So, um, so we're going to take a look at two of the projects. I guess they wouldn't be on your website <clears throat> because they're they're in in process. No, and I'm going to show you these um, in. Um, Sorry, I'm just uh, trying to find the one I want, which isn't there. Let's, um, uh, just loading that one. So uh, there's two projects I want to talk about today. One, one is actually one where we've just applied for what's called planning consent in the UK. And planning permission in the UK needs a lot of explanation to the as part of the process you have to go through it's a lot of discussion in terms of local democracy and all the rest of it so the way you present is really important and so there were two things about this that i thought might be of interest for people how do i get rid of that there we go um so um the first thing is that it is a um, it, it's a, a site which is quite a common problem in ARCHICAD in that you've basically got a, um, a sloping site, as you can see. Uh, and then we've got different house types. So we've actually got three different house types uh, on this site. Uh, and as well as the house types, we've got um, things like uh, some car shelters and some refuse stores. So one of the things I did fairly early on was I decided I was going to use mod files. So essentially that house type there, as you can see, the whole lot gets picked, is actually a mod file. Um, I had, um, and I started out running the whole things as iceberg, uh, using what's called the iceberg technique. So basically setting up a new story below and re recreating the houses. But I found that I was getting a whole load of errors and things went missing and various other stuff, um, which was really irritating. Things like you'd actually save it away and the chimney would disappear or you, the corner didn't work quite well or whatever. So I ended up putting them into separate PLN files. 
um, which is what these are now, and then saving them as mod, mod files, which gives you a similar approach. So let me, <clears throat> let me interrupt for a sec. <clears throat> so since not everybody knows what a mod file is, <clears throat> so you know all files on the computer have an ending, PLN, you know, DOC, you know, JPEG, etc. So MOD or mod is a file type that ARCHICAD will create. It's basically anything that you could copy, like select and copy, can be saved as a mod file. Um, and what that means is it will save one or multiple stories. Um, to do multiple stories, you would use a marquee um, and make the marquee heavy, so it, it refers to all the stories. Um, and there is a way in the file menu to either save as a mod or to do a copy and then save what's in the clipboard as a mod. Now, what you then do with it, you end up with a file sitting somewhere on your computer or on your network, um, is that you can place the mod into another file. Um, and you can do it more than once. So it is a hot link from, well, it's either merged in like a copy and paste, or it's a hot link which allows you to then potentially update it later because you can change that hot link, you can develop the mod further, and then the, um, the, the instances of it will update. So uh, mods are used for a variety of things, but in this case, you were using it as hot links into yeah. the right file? Yeah, it's a hot link because, as you just said, it allows you then to start with something quite simple and to build the detail. And every time you save it away, then basically it updates automatically uh, in the main file. Mm -hmm. uh, Let me just add one more thing, and then you can go on with the, you know, your specific project. <clears throat> so you can hot link in a PLN, so an entire other project, you know, like building A into your site plan. Uh, there, it will then have everything that's in the virtual building of that file, the building A file, um, uh, all of this, well, either single story or multiple stories, but all the layers, um, uh, et cetera, come in. When you do a mod, because you can select what layers are visible when you do the copy or you save as, um, it allows you to have more information in the PLN and just select the things that are relevant, like you might not, in some cases, bring in the 2D information because you just want the 3D model in the site plan and you're gonna be in the separate PLN project, you're gonna be creating your documentation. Um, so yeah. it gives you some flexibility. Um, so yeah. go ahead, uh, Tim. Yeah, so um, this uh, this one here, as you can see, give, gives you an idea of what you can do. So the whole of that, is a hot link file. It's actually a PLN, um, but it's acting like a mod file. Um, that's quite complicated to do. And as I mentioned, I found that I, it was a bit error prone. Um, I don't know why that is, but at the end of the day, you know, you have to make these things work. So I found that the best way was to do something that complicated as a PLN in a separate file. But actually, I can show you uh, one of the refuse areas so god that sounds terribly boring doesn't it but all architects know that this is what this is what life ends up being like so you've got a refuse area here that there is a mod file if we just isolate that so that you know has got um a bit of fencing around it you know some objects here um some objects like that that i've made simple stuff but that actually comes from um this here which is actually on if i remember rightly it's on a yeah you can see here in the stories you've got all of these different levels so if you look at actually in the st in the uh story settings You can see that this this is what the iceberg method um, is like, really, because you, you've got your main um, level that you're working with, which actually in this case happens to be there. And then all of these are below. 
when I was showing you the 3D just now, uh, none of these are visible because you can actually exclude those from a 3D view quite easily. Um, and, and it essentially gives you the option to say, I, I want to put something like a, the refuse thing, which we're looking at. I just want that on a story below. And I, notionally, I've just made all the stories 10 meters apart. It doesn't really matter. Uh, you can do what you like with that. Um, and um, so you then draw this, uh, you know, all of these are separate elements then. So you can edit this, do what you like, change it, change the colors. Uh, you can apply attributes to it. Um, you can actually add properties to all of these things. And, and at the end of it, you say, okay, well, I want to, I want to save that. Now you can just go to file, save as, and uh, pick mod file, um, which is, where's the mod file gone? Two, I, no, it doesn't work. It actually only- You're at 3D right now, I so mean, you have to be in plan. Uh, I need to be in plan. Um, there we go. So there, you, you know, you then save as, and it'll save, and we then should get the mod file. Um, module file near the top or module file from yeah. the clipboard. Yeah, so module file or module file from clipboard. So you can do that, and you then have to pick where you put it and all the rest of it. But actually, it's a much better way of doing it, and actually use Publisher. Um, so let's actually open, um, uh, sorry, let's just go here. Um, so, uh, where's show? So there we go, that's what I'm looking for. So you can see what I've done is I've actually, drew, I've just actually placed the refuse item in its own publisher folder there. And in the options, you've got this thing where you can actually say, I just want to actually publish the current story. You can also do a range, but in this case, I thought, well, it's fine because I've got, I've got a story called Refuse. I just pick that story and, uh, and I can save it. So whenever you're doing um, you know, an amendment, you do whatever you need to do. You've got all your publisher things in here. You find you find the one you want, um, and I'm not going to actually publish it because I don't know what that'll do offhand. It's been a while since I've worked on this file. But here, down here, you just hit publish. That publishes it to the correct location, and then in the hot link, you can then update straight away. So let, let, so, let me um, uh, explain a couple other things that I think will be important from a um, didactic point of view. And then I'm gonna ask you in, in terms of uh, your experience. So backing up a little bit, we have a multi-unit project um, with a number of things that are repeated, a few house types, um, a few sub-building, you know, the refuse area, uh, et cetera. And the advantage here that Tim's uh, doing is he's designing it in one place and he's placing the refuse things in multiple places. Um, <clears throat> similarly to some of the you know house types. Now, if you create that in a separate file, um, it'll work. You can then save out MOD files or um, uh, hot link in the actual PLN, as I said. But one of the issues is that the files can diverge in terms of definitions of data and um, attributes. So you might define a new surface material in a file, or you might define a new composite or you might uh, define a new property which contains data. And now you have two different files or maybe multiple files that may have somewhat different definitions, somewhat different you know, structure um, and reconciling those or keeping them synchronized is, can be tricky. By having some of the information in just a, a dummy story down below, it's guaranteed to have the same surfaces, composites, properties, etc. So you don't have 
that type of issue where you've changed a wall type in one place and it's not reflected in another. Um, yeah, that's right. So I think if, you know if if you haven't used mod files before, uh, or indeed external PLN files, um, it's well worth thinking about anything that is repeated a lot through a project. It could it, it it could be an element of a building like this. It could be a whole building. It it could be just a small detail, which relates to <clears throat> um, you know a, I don't know. A, sort of standard furniture fitting or something and where you've got multiple ones going on like in restaurants or whatever but certainly creating it in, on a separate story uh, as, you know using the iceberg method worth experimenting with and then using publisher to save it is just the publisher is one of the most underrated parts of Archicad in my view it is so powerful um, and saves you so much time that you should definitely be looking. So can you open the publisher again and just show what are the different things you're publishing, you know, like in this particular set? Um, give a little well, bit of an explanation. Do, do, yeah, so so actually what I've got here, this these are all the publisher sets that I've got saved for this job. So I've got uh, a BIMX file. I've got um, the current drawings, which actually is you. It, that's where I dump drawings that I just want to do. I've just done something to do with clay clearance, cl sorry, tree clearances and all the rest of it. So I put that in there, and I know where it's going to save it precisely. I don't have to think about that. It puts it in the right place. Um, DWG files are useful um, when you communicate with other people. So I set up. You know to say right okay if i want an updated dwg then there it is and it's all set with the right view with the right translators and all the rest of it um and the one here which was the interesting one here was the refuse one so basically that publishes that so if i changed any part of that now and then went to publish it would update everywhere that this is that this occurs in the file um yeah publish so up for a construction document set or not in this project yet uh not in this project because this is a planning stage um uh -huh. i can say you know i, I we're, we're going to have a look at another well i'm not sure we'll get to there i could probably find one um okay i'm not sure we're going to have time for all of that today eric <laughs> yeah that's fine and obviously you're covering on a lot of topics that could benefit from more explanation i'm just trying to add the key points that will allow people to you know, understand yeah. certain. Um, yeah. Now, you see a, a comment from Rich Matthews, who's another veteran user. He's down in the UK, so the other, I'm sorry, in Australia, he's uh, so the other end of the world. Hey, Rich, he says, I have a good proven solution to Tim's multiple dwellings on various RLs. Um, and uh, then it says that's all in one PL, PLN file. So, Rich, can you just um, type in um, uh, what, what you mean by RLs? Maybe everybody else knows, but I don't um so uh um but it, oh, definitely all in one pln file that he's doing it and barty asks why not make it a teamwork file and place the story where you require it then there are no external files to um manage okay so rich says um uh, different heights on the site so relative i don't know um locations uh so um in terms of teamwork versus pln it really doesn't matter it's this is um uh you can well one thing that you haven't um uh, you haven't mentioned tim is while you can publish out mod files and uh yeah. you know and, and you're doing that quite successfully you can hot link in a story of the current project um yeah. And so in some cases, that works just fine. You don't have to have it in a teamwork file. So that way you're not exporting, you're not publishing out of the project um, and potentially having things out of date. Um, there are some advantages each way. One is when you're doing the uh, separate stories and you're saying, I wanna link in or update the, the this refuse area, you know, cause we've got 10 of them scattered around the site um, yeah. and just update that hot link. If it is on a negative story or you know a separate story, of course you're going to get 
whatever's on that story, um, uh, it, there's no way of specifying that it's uh, specific layers. Whereas when you're publishing uh, out an MOD or you're saving out an MOD, you can restrict it to only certain layers or certain renovation types, uh, renovation filters, et cetera. Um, so there, there, there are, you have some more control, but in many cases you can just hot link in directly from the negative story. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> anyway, um, so Rich has different heights on site. Yeah, so relative levels. Okay, there we go, thanks. Um, yeah. And uh, Harry asks, how is published different than using favorites? Well, Harry, that's, they're very different things. A favorite is a way of um, uh, quickly uh, res picking up the settings of an element, like a wall, a window, or a roof, etc., cetera, um, and uh, very powerful. In this case, we're picking up an entire group of elements, a whole building, or a whole set of elements like this refuse area. So yeah. it's a group of elements. Um, so Rich Matthew says, this allows full site plans, sections, and elevations. Um, okay, um, so uh, we should definitely explore that, Rich. Um, I want to not distract Tim too much because he has a lot to share, but uh, I'll talk to you and maybe we can have you come on and, and show some of those things in a separate this, one. This, the, the whole of this file will actually run as elevation sections, anything you like. So if you draw a section through that, house you'll get exactly as drawn in the in the file so it's all and it's all live mm -hmm. the other the other thing i wanted to because you know we're going to run out of time otherwise eric yeah. um uh, so the other thing i did was i saw well i thought well i want to actually create some really nice renderings and um archicad renderings are fine but they're very slow <laughs> Uh, so I decided that I'd use twin motion and I experimented a bit with twin motion. Now I'm not an expert on twin motion at all. It, as far as I'm concerned, I know enough to do what I need to do. And that's it. However, one of the things I decided having started to use it was that uh, there is an option in twin motion that allows you to use either ARCHICAD materials or twin motion materials. And I decided to use ARCHICAD materials and ARCHICAD objects like trees. And that's because we have a tree survey on this project. So this tree, you know, here, this big one, is the correct size. It's the right height, it's the right width, it's every, everything about it is in accordance with the tree survey which means then that when I export this to twin motion, I get that tree. I don't get a twin motion tree. And if I show you the twin motion, and I was very pleased with twin motion, if I show you the twin motion files, that's what I was able to achieve with it, which I was really pleased with. There's quite a number of um, uh, different uh, files here. So we can actually, you know, you can uh, save the views. Um, some of the way that the, the cars go in is slightly odd because I don't think it kind of recognizes where you've got uh, especially meshes where you may actually have a you know a surface which has got four different levels at four points I think it struggles a bit with getting it but it's it's you know good enough um, some of the lighting I found quite hard to get right um, but you know again it's it gives a tremendous i mean that kind of thing actually the 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 site has got green fields like that nearby so sort of gives a pretty good idea and what you're then able to do is to, i was then able to use these images to drop into a report that we submitted with the application that gave um people who are not architects just local residents you know some nice images and and i think that that um uh which one was it so by the way can you can you just spin around on one of these just to show that this is a live image this is not just a pre-rendered saved image yeah i can exit there we go so yeah you can see um come on 
There we go. So Twin Motion is, is pretty impressive like this. I mean, this is a live, you know, there's no rendering time. Yeah. So for those of you who are less familiar with this, I'm just going to give my 30 second. So Twin Motion is a separate rendering uh, program that is made by um, Epic Games. Uh, we have a direct connection from Archicad into Twin Motion. Um, and uh, up until the end of last year, Twin Motion was free for Archicad users on subscription. I think even uh, now it would be something relatively inexpensive, like, I don't know, $500 or $250 or something like that to have a yeah. license. Um, yeah. So I've I've found I I've I've used it quite a lot, but I've I've gen or in 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 this case all of these uh, surfaces are Archicad surfaces, but the the way that the lighting I mean anybody who's done any rendering knows that lighting is the really tricky thing about any part of getting renderings right, and the lighting in Twin Motion is different to the lighting in um, Archicad and therefore the materials look different so you you've got to kind of play around with it quite a lot to 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 sort of try and get it right mm -hmm. um, but I'm I'm experimenting with it and this and the fact that you can do this and then just export any of these images you know so you can create images uh, like this and then uh, like this one and then just say I want to export that it's great and you you get really good quality things now these people here whoops um that they are uh there we go so these are actually people that you can move around and as you move them away you know they get that they, they get proportionately smaller uh you can uh, turn them around you know like this um the figures are quite limited there's there's not many old people like you and i eric <laughs> <laughs> there's um there's quite a variety of ethnic uh groups which is good but all of them tend to be young and very foot looking uh and so you know there's a couple of projects we've done which are elderly care homes and they uh, we're short we're short of old people <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, so, so, Tim, I, I want to make sure we get back to this project in the working drawing because one of the things that yeah, that's right. certainly uh, you're known for and that I know you, you really focus on is creating the model in such detail that you hardly have to do any 2D drafting. Um, yeah. So let's, um, let's uh, kill that one. Um, Oh, and the other thing is that there's a question from Michael saying, uh, what is the iceberg method? Um, can you tell us, you talked about negative stories and things sort of would be buried down below in the project, but are you actually looking at a, um, a um, uh, trace and reference that looks gray? Because that's where I've heard that term. No, it's just, I, I just heard that term as a description um, as to, the way the way you describe the idea of negative uh, stories, um, uh, and and I've just started to use it, but that's all. It's the same as the negative story method. Okay, so let me just give a tiny bit of context. The first time I ever heard that um, was when, before we even had uh, trace and reference, we had just ghost stories. Ghost stories were basically a way of saying I want to show a different story to coordinate you know, two stories, uh, uh, the information. Now we can reference other things. We can have a section, we can have, you know, uh, a detailed drawing, et cetera. But ultimately when you show the, the other information in context, you can give it a different color. And in the ghost stories, it was always a, um, a light gray uh, color. So it sort of looked like it was underneath ice. Um, now, what was, when I first saw this demonstrated, in addition to coordinating like the actual structure, in this company, I think it was Orchid Winslow in Arizona, if I'm not mistaken, they put reference elements, things that essentially favorites, um, that, and they would eye drop. And it looked like you were ice fishing. It looked like you were literally putting an eyedropper down and picking up on something that was under the ice. So that's where I heard it first. Um, and uh, it, it had a more visual reference to being you know, underneath ice. 
Yeah. So this is this. We're now moving on to another project. This is a um, a barn conversion in the countryside. So the 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 reason it's this shape is because it's an existing barn. The reason it's got black cladding is because it's a barn. Uh, ignore these extraneous bits because they're part of what I've been starting to create. And what I wanted to do is to say, okay, we've got something here where we look at the drawings up here. You know, we've got um, floor plans, and these are design drawings. So the walls have got no detail, they're just solid. Um, we've got uh, sections like this where, you know, there's no detail, they're just solid. Um, and we've got uh, some elevations like this. By the way, that is. There's a background image there, which is what gives you that sort of watercolory background. Um, but essentially, this is quite typical of where we would end up with uh, at the end of the, the, the detailed design stage. And we're then going to say, well, how are we going to transit this project into working drawings? So um, what I decided to do is to show you actually the way that I would do that. Um, so the first thing I've done is if we go back to the floor plan. So the first thing, let's look at the settings of that there. So what I've got is I've got a layer combination there, which I call GA, which in the UK is short for general arrangement. The scale is one to a hundredth. Uh, so that's what eighth scale, I think, in American. Um, I'm showing the entire model uh, and, and I've got an MVO called presentation. And I've got a graphic override called design plan. Uh, and I'm obviously using proposed as the renovation layer. Um, so, uh, and I don't use the structural analysis on this. Um, and I've got the dimensioning as meters as opposed to millimeters. Um, so, all of that is set for the kind of drawing that you would, you know, get client approval to. But of course, that isn't going to give you enough detail uh, for working drawings. So, the first thing we can do is to say, uh, let's go to a detailed plan, which actually, to start with, looks the same because I haven't actually done anything with these walls. But if you look down here, I've started to actually create here a wall. So this wall is really very detailed. I, I know exactly how I'm gonna build the wall. Um, and I can show all of the different materials. Uh, and so what I'm able to do is to take that element there and I can start to paste it and update this wall here. But before I do that, let's just show you what this is, because this is a complex profile. So, um, sorry, before I do that, let's go through here. Yeah, so that also relates to construction section. And you can see here, this is this looks just like detailing, but this is all 3D. Um, as you can see from the wall construction. And a 3D document that allows you to start labeling things as well. Some of these labels have kicked out because I've changed something or other. Um, so if we uh, take something like that as a, we've actually got different elements here. So we've got here a wall. I've then actually got cladding, and I do the cladding and the wall, the core wall. I do as two separate elements because of the way I want to embed the data. Uh, I've got a wall. Uh, sorry a floor construction there. I've got a wall here below ground level, 
which incorporates things like the edge detail for the floor where it has to be insulated into DPC. I'll show you, we'll work through all of this. Uh, and of course, we've got a foundation. And you can start to see little details like that there has got a red line in it. And that's the grid line, which actually, if you'll see in the section, you can follow it all the way through. So if we then go back to the construction section, you can see there we've got the grid line going uh, all the way through and it actually goes all the way through here so I know exactly where I should be aligning all of that. So all I'm doing here is say well I've got to draw this anyway because I've got to detail this show the builder how to make it. So what I'm doing is instead of detailing it in 2D I detail it in the complex profile tool. So let's start with a simple one like this one. That's a complex profile. So we'll edit the complex profile. And that is actually just two fills, that one and that one. And the way, I can't remember which way I've done it now, the way you get the lot, that red dotted line in is you use the override, there you go. So what I've done is I said that cut line there, I want it to be triple dashed, I want it to be red, and that just applies to that edge. And that then means that you can see where your um, the alignment of your concrete footing has to go, because it's precisely there. We then start to get a bit more complicated, uh, this one. This is actually a kind of gravel margin edge detail where you'd have a sort of dr like a drainage system around the building. So if we look at that that one, there we've got an element there which is actually hardcore. We've got an element here. These are different materials. So you can see over here that one's called chippings. That one is called hardcore. That one is in situ concrete and that one is precast concrete. Um, and so, uh, and of course you've got uh, the potential here to do clever things like those are the stretch lines for ver the vertical. So if I actually increase the height of this, it just increases this part here, doesn't change the dimensions of this. And these are the stretch for the width and again, I've positioned those right in the middle here, where if I expand that, makes no difference to the detail. It doesn't change this bit and doesn't change this bit. So um, that gives me flexibility there. And then you get to the point uh, where Jim, this can you just Can you just select uh, that one on the left and just stretch it horizontally just to show how, um, how that works? Uh, yeah, I think I just didn't. Uh, yeah, so it doesn't deform the end, it just uh, stretches the middle part. And so yeah. you can do that, of course. Yeah, there you go. Good. Yeah. This one is probably one of, this is a bit more complicated and it's got some clever tricks in it. Um, so I don't forget, all of these are fills. There's nothing but fills in here. You, there's no lines at all because lines don't show in complex profiles. So what I've got here is a build up is I've got insulation. Uh, sorry, the, the, there is a line there, but actually it's the opening reference line. Um, you've got here insulation. I've got then uh, a membrane and all of these are all materials that I've set up. I've, I use very little of what's in ARCHICAD because it doesn't, it's not relevant to me really. Um, I've then got an element here, which is a ventilation um, element. And what I've done is these arrows are just fills. So they're just a fill within a fill. Uh, I've then got here, this is actually um, the cladding, corrugated cladding. 
so basically they're all materials and i think you're all familiar with how you know how you play around with materials but essentially there's just a, a lot of detailing here which means then that i only need to do this once and i can repeat it right around the whole building and whenever i update it updates automatically um, one of the other clever things is that um, all of these elements have property data attached with them here so this is a label that is reading we actually open that label uh, that bit there the blue part is actually reading uh, a property field called specification that is reading a property field called drawing note and that is reading the element ID and there's a couple of other ones down here there's a U value property and there's a fire rating property so that is uh, just can standard select, auto can you, that element, can you select the element itself and just show those properties in that context so you can see it here you can look at the you know these are the properties that i've set so so you've got you know the um trade name is cladding the uh i've typed in there that bit i've typed in this element that's a pull down uh, menu and that's a pull down menu and you can edit in here but it's a bit clunky to do that what you really want to do is you want to edit it and this is the the bit that for me makes all the difference if i go to data specification um actually have i got a section right so i'm starting to build up the specification in this project and this is actually a list of every element in the project at the moment you can see some of them have actually got um starting to get bits added in but the ones we've just been looking at uh, um where this was the cladding there so by far the easiest way to actually edit is you go in here and you say okay well i want to change that corrugated cladding to something else and you know i want or i want to add data to it and you put it in here or you can copy paste it from somewhere else it doesn't really matter um and um you can then um when you update that it updates every element in the whole project and it is at the same time in giving you your specification list for the whole project and you can go through and you can look at everything so let me um <clears throat> interject something that could be let's say unclear so this is a an interactive schedule so we're all used to schedules for oh, yeah. win windows and doors that basically report on all the relevant elements like all the windows and have some sizing and some other notes and and things in there so you know all elements in archicad that are 3d certainly have some dimensional information um but regardless of whether they're 3d or 2d uh everything except maybe lines um can have text information associated properties there so when you put in properties, whether it's the manufacturer name or some specification data, um, that's associated with the element. And of course, you can get a report, a schedule listing it. Now, because uh, Tim has set up um, some basic ones in the project that he eye drops or reuses over and over again, when he um, creates a listing, all the ones that are similar, all the walls that are similar, are going to have the same reporting information even though each one has its own data they'll be merged in the schedule to um, to show that information now if you make a change in one of the schedule fields it affects all the elements that are currently in the project that are merged together in the schedule to say you know whether it's one wall or a hundred walls all of them have that data now part of the power of this doing it with the schedule 
is that we're not modifying one element or having to try to find all of the walls that are like that. The schedule is automatically pulling all the identical elements and merging them. And when you make one change, they all update. And then the final yeah. part of the, not puzzle, but the final part of the uh, use is what Tim showed originally, which is here are some notes. He just literally goes and uh, uses the label tool, says, I want to refer to this thing. And he has favorites that are going to have, uh, that are going to pull that information um, out. And uh, so these notes, whether it's in plan section elevation or a 3D drawing, will be consistent. Um, and that's what's so powerful about it. So if we want to actually do, uh, you know, to say, let, let's label that element there, you know, I can literally pick up that and I can then say, let's pick that, let's put it there actually. Um, rather irritating that you can't set the width before you actually keep complaining to Graphisoft about that. But basically there, it's picked up all of the information. I have not to type anything. And the other clever thing is that you can use the skin list tool. And that will actually read all of that as well. So what the skin list tool is reading is not property data at all. It's reading the information you've put in your materials, your building materials. So here, these, the, you know, the, the, the data here actually comes from my building materials. So there, you've got a build up there of um, all the different layers. But where it's reading the information from is actually from this list of building materials here. Now, so, you know, there, is that only for composites or does it work for complex profiles? Uh, it works for complex profiles because these are complex profiles. That's a complex profile. Yeah, how does it get there? How does it sort the order? How, how does it know what order to put them in? I don't know, Eric. It just does it. <laughs> this is 25. So this is about, you know, uh, and indeed it's the 25 update. So it's about as updated as you can get. But actually, this is something that uh, I don't think. I don't know when it came in, but it certainly wasn't in 22 or anything like that. And and it's great that it works now on complex profiles. And you and know, you just open up that complex profile. I just want to, you know, in the editor window, that particular one you just annotated. Uh, yeah, that. Sorry, that that's the one I was showing you there. That complex profile. If we go, it's the same as the one I showed you in the section. That is that complex profile. Okay, well that one actually came from um, a, originally a composite and you've added in some data. So I guess... <clears throat> no, it is, no, I just drew it. You just drew it? Okay. Yeah, I drew that from scratch. Literally, I mean, literally, if you want to create a complex, I mean, well, let's, let's actually look at a complex profile uh, as an example and I'll show you how easy it is to get this stuff done. So let's go into the section. So I think I've got one, got one here, no. So um, by the way, the, the, love to get your feedback, uh, those of you who are watching, feedback. Um, are you learning some things? Uh, are, how many of you are doing similar uh, things here? Um, just uh, let's, let's have a little discussion in the chat. And... Uh, for those of you who are in the ARCHICAD training course, you can put that your discussion um, into the coaching calls section as well. So if we wanted to kind of say, well, let's let's create something that actually does that detail there. So the clever thing we can do is let's just let's just just draw something fairly random. Let's give it a nice bright color so everybody can see it. Um, and we say let's actually draw, uh, we're just going to stick that on, on the arcade layer because we're only using this. As, let's, let's just sort of say, I don't know, we're going to draw something like that. I mean this isn't, this isn't particularly architectural but it gives you the idea. So we now will get rid of that 
we will uh, create uh, a new one. Uh, let's call it um, Bob Row. <laughs> Paste that in. Stick it there. You see, there's a like a red mark. So we've now got a shape, and we think, well, what's that made of? Uh, so we might say, well, actually, that bit there. Let's make that there out of timber. So just for the sake of argument, so I'm a bit timber. Uh, we'll say let's um, put a soffit in. And we'll make that there. We'll make that an, uh, like a just an airspace. I we'll call it a fixing, uh, the uh, fixing zone. And and that there is already uh, zinc. So I could decide. Well, actually, I want to um, uh, I want to add. So I'm I'm just gonna I'm just literally making this up as I go along. Uh, clad that and I and um, and I can uh, pick that up and I can um, say I'm going to do that and that and that. Uh, I want to do sort of roughly what's that? No, that. So we sort of got you know. You know something with a drip uh, we've you know got a void or if it save that um there's a little thing here where you decide what you want to do with it so let's save it as a beam but you then got um something um we can pretty randomly i mean this is where you can just stick anything you like really anywhere in archicad and you work it out later so we stick it in the first floor plan we know it wants to be a beam so uh we want the segment to be there we go bob bro stick it on the arcade leg we just and that's our beam so it's probably all at the wrong level but doesn't matter um there uh it's the wrong way around Actually, just to make life easy, I'm going to flip it. Like that. And then you stick that there. And all of a sudden, you've started to build a detail. Now, I know that isn't right, and it's going to, you know, it needs thinking about more work but you can see all you're doing is you're drawing something in 2d you can and and now you can edit this here because what you can do is say well actually i don't really want that to be like that i actually want the 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 roof area to be the roof to overlap it slightly so you know you can do something like that um, move that through to there and Get rid of that, go into that. Drop it in, uh, so all the way around, so we'll mirror it. Move it to there. Right, that, and we then say, so let's cut that, that, and that back. get rid of it and we've edited it so it now lets the roof go through and of course we have, we can SEO that you know so you you put that in there as an operator execute that and so it's the sort of thing you can do there and then you say well what is that you know that's maybe a kind of roof edge detail so uh what we do is we then say okay well what are we going to call it trade name we're going to say it's going to be roof so we pick roof pitch roof uh, well actually i've got metal roof because uh, it actually would be a metal roof and and i can just type that in and say that's going to be uh eve's detail because all i need to is to 
identify it so I know where it goes. And then if I go back to the specification, we will find uh, metal roof. There we go. As usual, I, I'm, my typing's crap, so I can just edit that. I can change the name of it so it's um, uh, 871 is say 02. And I can type something in here, you know, that actually says, uh, you know, what it is. It doesn't matter, you know, te more text in there. Uh, and if we rejig that, it reorders it which puts it in the right place. And um, if we then um, used a label on there, uh, whoops, that's a skin list label. Have I got one kind of there we go, detail. So I haven't got much detail in it at the moment, but essentially what data I had actually added there, you see it's automatically picked it up. And when I, and, and I've therefore started, get rid of that because So I've started my 3D detailing and I can work all the way through there. Uh, to make all of that work. And if I go back to um, the, uh, by the way, I, I, you've seen here that, you know, I've got quite an extensive view set. The, again, the view set, don't ignore it. I've got all of the different elements that I'm gonna need to create drawings of all separated out so I can find things. Um, so, there, you know, give you an idea of what you can then do with a construction section. And of course, this is live, so, and this is actually one to 10 scale. So here the view, it, it's actually in a different layer combination, which means it's got, let these labels show on this drawing, but they don't show on the GA drawing. Uh, it's The scale is there, it's millimeters as opposed to anything else. It's, it's got um, a graphic override, which is detailed drawing. Um, so essentially that means that then I could take this and um, let's uh, create a, a layout. So in A3 landscape. I've got that there and I can just drop that on there. And I can say, okay, well, I'm gonna just, you know, go that bit. I mean, it doesn't quite fit, so I'd need to, you know, think about how it's gonna manage that. But essentially you can see there, That's a detailed drawing and it's live. So whenever you change it, this drawing updates and it's, and it's whether you change the detail or whether you change the text, everything is live. So everything is completely integrated. You don't have to remember to go around and change a, a note or whatever. And it's fascinating that a lot of people have said, oh, well, Archicad doesn't have keynotes in it. And why haven't we got keynotes and the rest of it? And I've always thought, well, it has got keynotes in it. It's just that it isn't called keynotes. It's called properties. Um, so that gives you a sort of, I mean, I'm sorry, it's really fast and a lot of this is Pretty high level, Eric. I appreciate there are people on the call who are nowhere near this level, uh, but it gives you an idea of how powerful ARCHICAD is. You could just imagine running through a whole project and using that that kind of way of 
creating all of the information you need. Uh, and by the way, this detail here can be linked directly into uh, a, um, uh, a section. So see, we go cross section. Uh, so this is actually um, this is a one to hundred cross section. And if we wanted to, we could put a detail box in here. And then we can link that detail box to that detail drawing. But it isn't actually using the detail function in ARCHICAD, which, as far as I'm concerned, the detail function is a complete waste of time. And so, it so Tim, be <laughs> would you swap out? Would you swap out the walls for the new uh, sort of series of assemblies that you've just created? Yeah, you you can literally. Do, I mean, I, I must admit, I'm not entirely sure how um, the different walls are created, because that is there. It's a complex profile, I think. Yeah. So uh, I'm not entirely sure about w the relationship of that wall to this one. I think they're the, a different way around. Um, you see the way that the the um, that blue line, which is the anchor line, is different to this one. Um, so I'd need to kind of work that out. I think I'd need to just flip this round um, to make it work. So I think if I just if I just pick I mean, I can just do that, literally. All I'm doing there is pick up properties and there you go, drop it straight in. All right, well, let's just look at that section now that you've made that one change, which is, of course, <clears throat> just quick and dirty, but um, what... Uh... So if we then go back to... Um... You see the wall is now much thinner because it's only the core wall it doesn't include the cladding now you know we do have a uh, a graphic uh, override that's making it only show um it, it is yeah there's a graphic override which basically turns everything to just outlines because so can, you, can you turn that off I, uh, um yeah i can um change that to a detailed drawing now, of course, this and, and I, we would also really need to change the scale. But there. There's your detail. So the dog like. Me, yeah, let me explain something here for those of you who are, <clears throat> you know, find these manipulations like, what is he doing here? All right. So. <clears throat> Aside from the fact that the wall, you know, is only one part of the wall and not, you know, uh, you know, that uh, so there'd be more than one complex profile in the footing and uh, things like that. Um, essentially, uh, Tim starts with, you know, a conceptual, you know, wall is going to be about this thick and here's, you know, here's where it uh, goes, um, etc. Once he's um, uh, ready to detail it up. Um, then he's creating, in this case, multiple different composites that are um, what he called uh, that uh, give the that fill that volume with the right you know construction information. Um, now he still had the 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 option of showing it in a conceptual mode. So if you just put that graphic override back, um, let's just see what happens when you switch it back to the one that makes it all white. Um, and then, yeah. and then let's look at the diff what that graphic override is doing. Okay, so um, now uh, can you just open up the um, graphic override box and we'll just take a quick look at the um, what the settings are that make it all just white outline. All right. So just all cut fills are white. Okay, and just open up that setting, the, the three dot symbol on the right. All right, so this is basically anything that's being cut through when you have this graphic override turned on will change the fill to 
a background fill, basically no line work, and making um, the foreground fill be a white, in this case, pen 121 there. Yeah. So um, that's a very quick way of saying, you know what, even though there's a lot of detail here, I don't want to show that. I simply want to um, have it be white. And uh, so you can retain a simple drawing output when you find it appropriate. But of course, when you uh, have the right scale and you don't have that override or you have a different override, then you're going to see all that detail that Tim was demonstrating is not so hard to create. Now, one thing I'm a, a little bit not su surprised isn't quite the right word, but you know, was caught, uh, found it interesting, is that you're creating these out of multiple different assemblies, um, and uh, as opposed to trying to make one wall that has like all those pieces. Um, can you talk about managing those? And you know, here we have a, a line in between, you know, in between those two, so you don't have yeah. the clean thing. So, so um, the reason I'm doing that is because I want to tell the builder about different elements of the building, mm -hmm. uh, and and I have to make a judgment as to how much of it, how much I break it down into. So what I tend to do is to think, well, actually, I'm going to create here a structural element for a wall because I can describe that as being. A timber frame, and I can add then um, the ins I, I, you know I can describe the insulation and the lining on the inside. I could break it down more and more and more, but of course what that's going to do is um, uh, just make it more complicated. Um, I mean there is an argument to say actually here I'm mixing. I've got some block work and I've got timber frame. We could quite easily say actually. Let's take that block work out. And put it in there. Like that and save it like that. And now I've got that bit. So I can actually then describe this, which is all masonry, as one element. Because actually, that is going to be done by a different person. So th this is done by the bricklayer. This is done by the carpenter. The mm -hmm. cladding is done by the cladding guy. So that right. essentially is that I've got three different trades. Yeah. And so also, I've got a wall, uh, sorry, a floor there, which is again, yet yeah, a different trade. And you could break that up as well. You could say, well, I'm actually gonna break the finishing out with the concrete, but you know, the, there's not that much to describe. So you can, you know, you you, you can break it up or, or combine things. Um, at the end of the day, it's about how you communicate with the, with the builder. Right. And make a judgment about what you can. Uh, and of course, the more you can combine into one, the faster the whole thing runs. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. there's a comment from Deepun Gandhi that I think is very relevant here. It says, I think this method can bring us back to the forefront of the building process as the master builder, which means that contractors can respect our work again and understand how we have virtually built something with little or no errors. It'd be interesting to know how Tim uses and relays this virtual building and information to builders on his projects. So I think, you know, you've just described that by doing things, breaking things up into certain pieces, you can easily talk or communicate to different trades in, you know, the focus of, you know, for this is going to have to be done in this way and this part, you know, you're telling yeah. a different trade. And you can, I mean, it's very useful to be able to do it like this, to be able to show, you know, you could show a builder this uh, if you wanted to. Uh, I don't tend to. This this is just as an explanation for today. But you could imagine it would be possible to do that. You can certainly use 3D documents like this to show because one of the advantages of the 3D documents idea is it allows you to annotate so again this is um you know the label tool 
uh, here, which picks up the data in that element. Right. So let, let me just also explain this 3D document. Not everybody uses it, and it's good to know. You basically take any view in 3D, in this case, a marquee of a certain little area of the project with perhaps certain specific layers turned on and others may be turned off. And then that view, which you're looking at in 3D, you right click in empty space and say, create 3D document. Now you have something like a section or an elevation that's a live view of part of the model and the elements actually can be selected as you saw Tim selecting and annotated because it's actually like a section a view of the model that you can draw um, notes on you can and of course yeah so if we take something like uh where's all my 3d views here we go step cutaway view so this is a this is a design drawing but it gives you a, a an idea of what you can do um, it's probably having to think about I've got, I, I, there you go. So this is a, a cutaway section through the building. But you could just imagine being able to say the builder, uh, let's actually look at that. Uh, let's look at that bit there. So we say, well, let's actually make a 3D. So you pick that new document. Um, And would create that. So this is this is now creating a 3D document of this view, which takes a little while because there's a, you know there's furniture and there's books in the bookcases and everything you know so there's quite a lot for it to think about. Um, there we go. Take that long. Um, so. Uh, this now can all be labeled. Um, you can't manipulate a 3D view. So you can't, um, you know, you can't look around. You decide what your 3D view is and, and it fixes it. So there it is fixed. You can then change your 3D view. If you go into 3D document settings, uh, over here, you can do the cut fill uh, where you actually, you've got a lot different options. Um, that will change that. Um, that's the cut fill is changing. I'm not quite sure. So, one side note, uh, Tim. Um, Tracy Sharples asks, I like this method, but it uses a lot of color. What happens if it's printed in black and white? Is clarity lost? Do you, how much printing do you do versus on screen? I, I actually try and avoid printing completely. Um, what I try and encourage contractors to do is actually to use um, iPads and things like that to get the drawings because they then access them in PDF. They're much, much easier to get on site. So we, Every, everything on a project we actually have on a cloud-based system that basically means they can get drawings anytime they like and they also have the confidence to know that that drawing is current because it's on the site so it's my job to keep it up to date mm -hmm. uh, um, so, so um, from deep one do you publish to bimx and uh, as much as anything how is it received by them so or um, BMX is, it, it depends on the um, attitude of the people involved. Uh, some, some people absolutely get it. Some contractors love it. Uh, some of them don't really um, understand it for some reason. Some of them don't want to understand it. <laughs> it depends. But it is very powerful being able to do something like that and pick out, you know, you could say, well, I'm just going to pick the stair out. There's a stair, which is just a, it's a stair done in ARCHICAD. And, and you can then, you know, you could detail this now and you can start, you can't, you know, the stair doesn't have a quite as much 
complexity but you can technically you could actually put different data for all the different elements here you know the treads are capable of classification and properties independently of the risers independently of the beams and the structure so you know you can actually get you you can actually get a lot of detail in there but of course this is just you know this is going to go to somebody who's actually going to design this and work out how to make it i'm not yeah. telling them how to make a staircase I, will, I tell them how to make a wall but i don't tell them how to make a staircase that has to go to a specialist company who does all the detailing and the design and then submits it back to me occasionally they may even do it in 3d and submit it back in, as a, a 3d file of some kind but generally they don't they, you know we are way ahead of, of most of the builders and suppliers we deal with mm -hmm. um you know, so, they, there's a, and that's why going back to this eric the reason that i work like this is not actually because i want to be nice to the builders or even to nice to be the clients i work like this because this actually means that i can do the drawings in about half the time mm -hmm. i mean that's that that is the key point here this isn't really about saying isn't this wonderful using archicad like this okay yeah it might be but actually you, the the thing to generate it's all of the uh the data that you can pull out here you know you end up with things like i don't know what have i got there i've got shed schedules are just amazing what you can do with schedules mm -hmm. um so so there is a management question that's come up um here from nathan brower um who's saying i find it challenging to keep track of complex profiles and modules they tend to multiply for some reason i wonder if it sometimes uh well he has an interesting feature suggestion for graphs i wonder if it would might be more efficient to annotate the complex profile directly except there's no way to put a complex profile on a layout sheet or save a view of it but um he says uh that it's always a challenge trying to distinguish between design and construction view Tim needs several complex profiles to describe the single wall, which is tough to coordinate. Um, and uh, so, uh, do you run into issues? You know, like as I as I pointed out, you had several different walls where originally it might have been a simple conceptual uh, thing. Um, is that? Do you find it complex to prof uh, to uh, manage, or is it pretty much? You can see if there's an error. You can see if something's misaligned. You can see if, if the wrong component is being installed. Yeah. I mean, you know, yes, there is. I think that the the kind of system I'm running is but has very much been developed for small practice. And if you've got you know 20 people working on the same project, keeping track of everything requires a different level of management complexity and probably a whole load of more different tools but for a lot of small practices which i know is that you know is a lot of the people who um have always historically been your client base Sarah, you know this is uh, absolutely fine um so yeah it just allows you, you can do you know you, you can run schedules in lots of different ways uh this one for instance you know this is basically just a list of everything in the project. So I actually say, well, I know what the renovation status is. I can see that these at the top here haven't got anything um, attached to them. I can see what layer they're on. You know, they're on the temporary trash layer, which means that they're probably not relevant anymore. And I may just be able to delete them, but I can go through, I can then, see you know what everything is on and i can spot the fact i've got things things here managing styled classification elements is actually really quite hard still so managing what goes on with a tread is quite difficult because it automatically gives you all the different treads so it's quite a lot of work to muck about with that but uh, you know you can technically well, you might, do you might, want to, you might just want to eliminate in your criteria sub components like treads because you're not going to as you said yeah. you're not going to be telling the the stair fabricator you know how to build it um 
Now, I do have a bunch of questions, Pam. What I'd like to do is just sort of get quick answers to these because, you know, these were put yeah. in earlier, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So t Tom Marcunas has a, a specific question about why is the concrete footing so deep? Normally, we see a spread footing. Mm, it's just the way we do it in the UK. I mean, you you dig a hole and you drop some concrete in the bottom. It's not really very complicated. Um, all right, that's how you do it in the UK. All right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right, Rob. Uh, well, sorry, just to clarify as well, what you might do is where where is that section? There we go. Construction section. Um, what you would do here, for instance, the the what I've assumed here is that the builder is going to that the bottom of the foundation down here is going to vary because as you dig the hole, you're going to find some bits you've got soft spots. We're digging it into clay in this part of the UK, so basically this might sometimes be this deep, might sometimes be slightly deeper. But what you do is you bring it up to a level so that you've got three three quarters of block because you don't want to have to start cutting blocks so your kind of datum level is here somewhere um and and this of course can actually be you know that that can vary in depth um depending on because it's stretchable right okay. um, um yeah uh rob hancock says it's good to see british specific archicad skills on screen and on this occasion, witnessing the power of BIM in action. That said, I suspect that the building material schedules and properties database has taken a long time to generate. I know you've been working on this for, for years, but um, if you were starting from scratch and you knew everything you know, but you just didn't have the database, is it something that would take days or months? Uh, I, I think it's actually not that difficult to develop the drawn detailing because all of this well I, I drew that this afternoon took about 10 minutes I think um, because I knew what I wanted to draw so that's a, that's really fast and you've got to draw it if you're going to do detailing anyway so I don't think that takes any time and when it comes to things like the specification side of things you may well already have um specification data in uh, a, another form it might be in a uh, a text document it might be in a spreadsheet might be manufacturer's data um and so what you can then do is just copy paste straight into the schedule so here mm -hmm. if you go into the schedule this this uh, bit here it's just text Mm -hmm. So you you can copy that from another you know live you can copy something straight off the off the web and put drop it in there if you want to it, it's so I don't think it's really that um, slow from that point of view and okay. and I, I and I do update this all the time because I'm constantly thinking oh there's a better way to do it or as a new product or a builder says to me, you know, I actually always find I want to build it this way rather than that way. And I, I always listen and say, OK, fine, let's talk about it. OK. All right, David uh, Yaguchi says the label tool is used to access the data file for the building materials. It's not a data file. It's basically the label tool is able to put in text that you manually type or text that's pulled from an associated element and the text that's pulled from the associated element can be broken up into different things like the drawing note versus um, you know other other things so those properties can be included and they're coming from the properties that are associated with the, the building element um, so so these are two different th these these here are basically labels that are both pointing at the same element this one here this one here is pulling information from the properties of that element which i've defined this here the skin list is pulling information on the materials but of course i've actually defined the materials as well so i have a material called p10 insulation phenomic phone insulation that's in my materials list so oh. all of the data is created by me but it's just in two, you know, in different uh, 
parts of the um, uh, of the whole process. Mm -hmm. Okay, a number of people were talking about framing, and uh, obviously you've got your horizontal elements, things that are extruded along the length of the wall shown in the complex profile. But as you and I know, you can't uh, use that same approach for vertical framing, for studs, uh, let's say. Um, and so uh, I outlined just in a couple of responses, you can either create a column that's the size of your framing and repeat it every 16 inches or half a meter or whatever it is, um, or you can use something like the curtain wall tool where you define like any, uh, well, essentially a system saying, we're gonna have these members repeated every so often. And the curtain wall tool can be pretty interesting um, way to do it. What do you do, Tim? Do you do framing at all? Yeah, uh, I, I... I do. I, I think I probably will on this project, but I will probably do it. I've already put some battens in. the The trouble with the curtain wall tool is that I find it. You know, by the time you've mucked about with the window openings, that it's actually faster. I mean, what you know, there's there's a column, one I made earlier. You copy it over here, uh, and you think, well, actually, it's going to be. Um, uh, a 140 by 38 because that's the standard size of column the timber frame that we use in the UK you stick it there um, sorry it's just finding a pick a pick point and I need to sort of think about this because I might need to do more in terms of insulation you probably want a double one there you know by the time you've done that and done a double one uh, and you know, and you and you think, well, actually, I'm probably going to want, you know, one there because I've got a wall in, and you use something, you know, I might need two of those. So you, you and then and then you then you can start. To, oops, then you can actually start to say, well, let's stick stick them in at 600 centres, but you you know you end up with one, so you end up thinking, oh, you probably put one somewhere in the middle and you start doing it like that and it doesn't take long to do um, so I would tend to do it like that mm -hmm. um, rather than anything else now by the way that, that, that is a single element it's a column and yet it looks like it's a cut through um, with the lines can you just show how that's um, uh, defined in your it, complex uh, it's uh, it's just on the floor plan here um that you've actually got um where is it the bit here symbol type here it's just an oh, x all right so this is not a complex profile this is simply no, just i mean it could be but but i don't need it to be it's just a piece of timber so that can just be a simple column uh, and i can then go through and i probably talk to the structural engineer who might say well actually we've got to have some extra um, double columns here and there where we've got point loads and you know things like that you just work you just work through it um, okay. but of course once you've got that going all of those you know have the same um, data attached and and you know therefore you just say well those are the up those are the uprights and they're this size and they're this specification and then as you repeat it around the building it all um, fits. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you, Tim. Um, let's see, uh, Michael Robichev, are floors and roofs also complex profiles or are they composites? And I explained that you can only use complex profiles on um, things like walls and beams that are extruded, uh, whereas polygon elements like uh, slabs and roofs um, are going to be composites uh, because that's just not the way that our kid can detail so composites yeah. you can have different skins but you can't have things punctuating them um, along the the volume and, and especially when you've got this which is a shell so you can have that as a composite but you can't have it as um, a complex profile but then you know you probably think well you don't need that to be a complex profile that can be a that can be a composite because the complex profiles are all at the 
connection details. So there's, there's a whole lot of detailing here to do with the wall plate and how it fits and what happens that I haven't even started to think about yet, but that will all be drawn as a complex profile. And then you just run it around, you know, the, the different instances that it operates in the building and, and, um, uh, and you create new complex, pro, you know, you create multiple complex profiles. Uh, and the other thing to bear in mind is the way you might name them because you can start to get quite a lot. So what I, just on naming, so this is a hell of a lot of information for a very short time. Um, but um, the way I name everything is um, I tend to use uh, an old system called the common arrangement of work where you actually say, you know, foundations, for instance, are D, um, uh, you know, concrete floors are E, stairs are L30, you know, and what I do is I say my naming system for layers is exactly the same as my naming system for surfaces. And it's the, exactly the same naming system for materials, because I only have one system to remember then. Mm -hmm. and, and so that allows me to keep control of all this stuff. And also it means I know exactly where to look you know, when I'm looking for something. Because when you look at what you get as a standard template from Graphisoft, it's a complete nonsense. I mean, it's all in a funny order with some strange names, half of which, you know, we would, and half the materials we don't use in the UK. So, you know, I just strip the whole thing back. I mean, there's lots and lots of conversations to be had about standard naming to comply with BIM regulations and all the rest of it. But again, I don't, deal with that um, you know I'm doing this as essentially as an internal office productivity um, uh, thing mm -hmm. I'm not because I you know none of the people I deal with have a they haven't a clue what I'm talking about when I'm showing this they've got no idea so I mean I just say <laughs> you know I'll do um, I'll do it as an internal productivity uh, thing um, and actually at the end of the day it wouldn't be that difficult to change all of the naming systems to whatever national or international standard we all arrive at um, but I mean those people who think in the UK have looked at what we're doing in the UK as standard naming systems for layers and all the rest of it I think it's you know it's ridiculous it's you know okay get about and now you get a 10 digit alphanumeric code before you actually get anything you can actually understand that tells you what it is, mm. um, you know. So I'm going to go on with some additional uh, questions and feedback. Is that OK, Tim? Yep. All right. So David Norman says, Imp impressive workflow. Thanks for sharing. It's daunting to upgrade a template from scratch to incorporate these ideas, but great food for thought. So if you were to, um, say, sit down at somebody's um, office that didn't have your template, what would be the first thing that you would do to just start giving them the benefit of, you know, this approach? I think at design stage, I'd say start using complex profiles really early. So this wall here which there's not much detail of is still a complex profile it's not a composite because that then means that i can edit this and where everywhere i've used it when i get to work in drawing stage it will update so that's very powerful um, and i would also then say draw what you need to draw you know you don't have to actually create a template that's got everything in it to start with you could start with one project and say, for this project, I need all of these different things. But what you then do is work out the technique you're going to do to save that and to be able to reuse it. And that brings us into something which we could spend another three hours talking about, mm -hmm. uh, but we won't, which is the whole issue of favorites. Right. Uh, 
By the way, are you, Again, are you still using a yeah. separate file um, and copying yeah. and stuff? Yeah, I have a separate file. Uh, I don't know whether I can even, um, uh, which one I've got open. <laughs> um, my favorites file. I'll show you my favorites file. So the way I work is I'm building this favorites file constantly. It, it changes probably several times a week. Uh, if we actually look at um, Sorry, this is, this is quite a big file, this one. I think I've shown you... a separate before. file that you save all of your reusable elements um, and, yeah. and you copy and paste them selectively into the active project. I need one of these, I need these four things, etc. And by having yeah. them in one separate location hey when you ever whenever you create a new wall type or a new something or another you can then paste from the active project into this and it then becomes available so that's um do, uh, do, we don't have to worry about hot linking you're yeah. simply just pasting right yeah i tend to do it the other way around and the reason i do that is because i'm trying to control the attributes all the time so what i don't want to do is to start creating something in a new file where I inadvertently create a new attribute or whatever without actually being careful about that. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, okay. this is... You create, so you create it within the favorites file and then once you say, yeah, that looks good, you then copy and paste it into your working file and uh, you yeah. know that if you did create a new building material, you created something else, then it, they would both have the same numbers. Yeah, exactly, because actually, and what I mean by attributes is stuff like, um, you know, you you uh, actually we can look at the attribute manager. Um, mm -hmm. So there's your this is your attribute manager. Um, so what I've got here is is um, you know we've got different. Um, different layers, we've got different layer combinations. We've got things like pens. I don't use many, but you know, line types, you know, I've got line types and I've got some line types that I've created. Um, fills are all named. So it's all the same naming system. And I mean, this has been developed over some time and it, it works but I basically create new stuff in this um, in this part in one file so I, I know all of these things you know what it's like you kind of do something and you you know like cladding concept and you might call it concept cladding by mistake and you end up with two layers sorry two surfaces and you think well which is right which is wrong um, I just wanted to show you. Right, that's that's your workflow there. Okay, now we're seeing um, your. Uh, now this is. Um, I think it's the wrong way up. Are we looking upside down? The trees look yeah. like. Uh, Sorry, it's for some reason. I think it's because I was looking at something. Um, From underneath, yeah. <laughs> from, uh, no, it's the it, it's actually regening it, um, which is a pain. It's it's because it's in the wrong mode. Um, you can view. click toward it. You can just click yeah. in there. Let's look at it. I, I mean, I wouldn't operate it like that anyway. But if, say say for instance, I want to go um, uh, and say here we go. Um, I, I've got a combination of of things that I use. So if I wanted to draw an existing wall in a house then i've got a favorite saved in my main template in, in a template which i use for all my new projects an existing wall is already there and it's already got all the data set and all the rest of it but if i want to do something a bit 
uh, that, that's more variable. So say for instance, I've got a kitchen. This is actually, um, you know, one of the standard furniture layouts. Um, you'll see that actually it's already got, the trade name is existing, it's just noted as a kitchen. It's got the right ID, so I know what to do it. And I can just copy paste that. So I can copy that in, say, um, and I, I would drop it in here, there you go. So I've got two instances of ArcCAD open at once. And I literally copy between one and the other. So I just say, okay, well, I've got that there. I know all the data is correct. I know it's on the right layer. Everything about that is absolutely fine. So I can then put that where I want it and update. And I can undo that. By the way, Nathan says that favorite file is scary slow. It's because Tim had it set for a certain type of 3D regeneration that is known to be slow. You had vectorial uh, yeah. stuff opposed to um, OpenGL or uh, hardware acceleration. So it, it normally it wouldn't be slow like that, Nathan, and he would just have it open all the time, so it's not... Um, yeah, it just sits there, and, you, and you've got things like, um, I mean, the real power of this... If it was it, slow like that, it would slow you down, but... Yeah. You know, uh, a rare. Yeah. Um, so there are a couple of last things. We're right at the two-hour mark, and I think we should finish up, and it's 11 o'clock for you, I believe. Right. Yeah. Um, so standard bathroom layouts, you see, Eric. Mm -hmm. So you've got, you know, you've got. I mean, and you're going to change them, but basically, you've got everything you need already in there. So you just literally pick the whole thing. All the data's embedded. You've even got the the zone. You've got the lights in, and then you you drop it in. And you you know that layout works or or you want that layout whatever so when i do bathroom lights i tend to kind of save them like this and of course these are all you know they're all 3d so so yeah so um nathan had a separate question do you ever use a spreadsheet to feed your schedule as in working with a co colleague so export um a spreadsheet um for re-importing um after someone's edited it in excel yeah i can I, I have done that a couple of times um uh so that works really well as long as the colleague actually understands the limitations because you are look you're editing a it's a special kind of spreadsheet that archicad creates uh and so I think I've read some stuff where you you know you you might need to kind of give people a bit of control over um, what they can and can't do, you know. Right. Okay. So you do use it. You have to be careful. Yeah. All right. Uh, Paul Lewis, is your entire external wall a complex profile? And if so, can you cut a window into it, or am I misunderstanding it? So you have multiple complex profiles in some cases. Um, obviously, where you put in a window, you had two. You had cladding. And you had the core um, there. Yeah. So what do you do in that case where you uh, you've decided that it's worth having two separate walls? Yeah, well, I, uh, and that's because actually when you look at um, if you put a wind, uh, I got in here. Yeah, when what you do is you'd say, well, the window sits in the structural wall, uh, and then here I've got another one, which is that this is just a uh another opening which is a a blank opening and what that does is that that has the trim around it which deals with the cladding and you do have to go through and change the position of this but again you know you do that in elevation it's very quick you you just can drag it and move it around to suit, okay. copy it across. So the when you have two two walls parallel to each other because you're you've decided that for structural or let's say for informational purposes is uh, yeah. you want to get that, then that's one compromise. You're putting in windows and then you're putting in openings um, yeah. and you have to coordinate it. So yeah. you know that's a compromise. I would say instead of putting in one window, bang, it's there. You're putting in a window yeah. and an opening. Um, okay. So, um, 
So yeah. you're getting, you're, you're doing a little bit more work, but the benefit is that you're getting, um, you're getting better coordination of data. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, Joel Bartlett, do you have a way to name, to have the name of a zone display in both plan and section without placing more than once, for example, a room name? Yeah, I don't, I, I the, the, all of these, it does have zones on. Uh, here we go. This zone here. So that's the name on the plan, and is that? Uh, do you have a way to have it show in a section? Mm, no, we can't do that. They keep telling us we're going to do it. I, I, I don't really find that I need it much on section. Uh, yeah, it'd be nice to do. I, I. They keep saying that, and they're going to do that, don't they, Eric? And then. Well, there is an object that I've seen someone offer for free um, that uh, you know does pull the data from the zone into an annotated note. So essentially, you you can annotate in a section and just have it pick this pick up what zone is in there. Um, I can't remember if, if you were to look at zones in section, um, you know, uh, in a Google search, you'd probably find that object or label zone in in yeah. section. Um, I haven't really done, a, and actually a lot of the time when I'm showing client sections, I actually am using uh, cutaways. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the way I showed you earlier with that cutaway section. Right. So Jeff Robinson says, will there be any further special training available on these complex profiles in their applications or use? So Tim created a course a few years ago, you know, as part of the Masters of Archaeology series that's still available. And as I said, roughly, you know, I'm going to say 80% of the stuff is is still very much the way it's done. Um, the main difference that I recall um, is the, uh, the that you we didn't have the <clears throat> property fields at that time, so you had a different way of associating text information with elements. <clears throat> yeah. We and I had talked about at one point, um, Tim, just doing a supplemental lesson that was specifically saying, you know. Here's here's that um, update, and uh, we haven't done it. Um, I've I've taught many of these things in the best practices 2020 course, um, not nearly as detailed as what Tim does, or it's uh, you know as elegant, you know in in uh, but uh, certainly all the principles are there. Um, but uh, it is something that uh, Jeff, if you if you wanted to talk further, we could uh, we could explore that uh, possibly in the my Archaeology coaching program. I can ask your questions there. Um, so uh, we have a lot of thank yous. And then, uh, oh, Gerald Hoffman says, you can now show zones in sections. There's a new Archicad video on it. So you can show the zone in section. And then, Gerald, can you annotate it? Can you put the zone name? I mean, can you see a zone stamp in the section? Um, so, oh, and Reina Palavan said, on zones and sections, there is a solution new checkbox under project preferences so can you check on that um tim right now just to go to uh project preferences and see if we can track that down it's um zones all right i'm not seeing it there um so we'll have to track it down um but uh um so he has a link I think I think that's homework for you, actually, Eric. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Um, <laughs> yeah. I see. Uh, uh, Raina um, put in a link. I'm just going to um, say thanks, so that way it'll um, show up for everybody who wants to copy that link. All right. Um, so, Tim, fantastic uh, to catch up with you, see you know your work again, and and have you explain in a context that you know everyone can relate to uh, taking a project from a conceptual level up to a highly detailed level, looking at, um, you know, some of the data, uh, you know, parts of ARCHICAD as well. Um, mm. So uh, he covered a lot in two hours. Um, you know, my head is spinning a little bit, even for me, you know, <laughs> so it's good. Yeah. Um, yeah, any, closing, any closing words, anything you want to say? who are ARCHICAD assembled? 
No, but I, I, may, I think mainly about this thing where uh, there's a lot of discussion about um, uh, within the ARCHED community about 3D modeling. And I don't think that there's enough discussion about how you actually communicate to builders. Because at the end of the day, that's the reason we draw. We don't, you know, I mean, I know a lot of the drawings we do, we love the look of them, we do renderings, it looks fabulous and all the rest of it. But the way you actually earn a living is by, you know, communicating what's in your head. You've got to do drawings that explain how to build it. And uh, and actually, I, I can't remember the the, the name of the of, of the guy who made the comment earlier about the master builders aspect of it. Uh, and and it is interesting that that's something I've always done throughout the rock, the whole of my career. I've always felt as I need to know how to build it. Mm -hmm. And if I can't work out how to build it, how to explain to somebody else how to build it, the question in my mind is, can you build it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if you can't build it, you're just wasting everybody's time, you know. Uh, and and that's where actually doing it like this and checking it, you think, I know how this is going to be built. You know, I couldn't build it myself. You know, I'm terrible at DIY and stuff like that. But I can explain to somebody else what my thinking is. And that then starts, a, you know, the communication needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that actually it, it, that's where I, I would always say start with ARCHICAD on the basis of use it as a tool for your own practice and the benefits that flow from it for your own practice and then actually ex expand into how you interact with other people in terms of BIM standards and all the rest of it as a separate, a separate thing once you can actually use it for your own purposes um, and just do do with it whatever whatever kind of building you do you know you do that you don't have to learn it all you know a lot of people are doing like i am relatively simple buildings so don't make it any more complicated than it has to be you know just do do what's needed to communicate okay well tim Great closing words. Thank you again. Thank you all for joining us. Um, this uh, has been recorded and I should be able to post that on the YouTube channel um, and uh, on the Arcad user website. So um, again, thanks for being all part of the Arcad community and um, we'll be back. I'll be back with next month with uh, another uh, veteran user. Um, I haven't decided which one. I, I know I've, I've invited a few for the next few months since so I've got two others that are um, sketched in Roderick Anderson and uh, Tracy Stone um, I think it might have been one other person who's confirmed as well um, uh, but uh, we'll have some good good people you know Tim you've uh, you've been very inspiring and I really appreciate your time that's great uh, right. but my pleasure yeah all right okay Take all right Eric. well give my best to Susan his wife. I will. Yeah. Thanks very much indeed. All right. Night. Well, it's night for me anyway. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Take care, okay. everyone. Thanks for Bye. joining.